What's better than an AMS-fed shared nozzle-based 3D printing ecosystem? A tool changer. And that's not up for debate. It's why the Prusa XL is still the king of the 3D printers, because it's really the only mainstream, non-niche tool changer printer that you can buy without having to build yourself from scratch. Until now. The Snapmaker U1 is not just another mid-range Core XY grey box. It's not even just a grey box, it's white. It is, in fact, the first... I consider it an honour, then, to be one of the first people out there to be able to introduce you to an entirely new era of 3D printing. Welcome, then, to the era of affordable tool changers. I know that might sound dramatic, but I do mean it. The future of printing is about to change. What Snapmaker have done here, if they can pull it off, is to show the world that you can have a machine like this for around the same price range as a bamboo or a Creality. I don't think this will kill off the budget AMS system because you can get AMS systems really cheap. But tell me this, if you have around $1,000 to spend on a printer, and it seems like many of you do, that poll makes sense now, doesn't it? But do you want a slow one that poops out the back, or do you want a fast one that wastes almost no filament? But you may have noticed a condition there. There was a big if. Can they make this machine a success? Because if they can, it will be a very compelling printer to buy. I don't yet have the answer for you, whether they can or not. I'll talk about that a bit later. We could take a look at this pre-release unit, and we could try and get some clues as to how things are going. And I have some other information too, including having a look inside. Let's go. This video is sponsored by PCBWay, and in terms of disclosure, the machine was sent to me as a pre-release test unit by Snapmaker, and it's not a final unit. The video is sponsored by PCBWay and not Snapmaker, nor have Snapmaker paid me anything, nor have they asked me to say anything, nor do I have any vested interest, other than obviously if you, if you do buy the printer, then you could use the affiliate links at the end, but that is the same for every printer I review, and I do tend to review most printers, or at least most new ones. So for those of you who do not know what a tool changer is or why it's something that I get excited by, it's a machine that has evolved to solve some of the main challenges around 3D printing in multicolor, or more importantly, multi-material. They don't poop. They don't cross-contaminate. They don't need to have complicated feeding lines. They don't need to unload between colors, and they don't need all the motors involved in that. And most importantly, they don't poop. The principal idea is that you keep the nozzle, the heater, the heatsink, and the extruder on the tool, and then you have a single Core XY carriage, for want of a better word, and it might seem like a more complicated solution to the problem, but believe it or not, well, it is. That's why they're more expensive. That, and you need n times the hot end components and n times the extruders, but the hardest part, believe it or not, isn't any of that, and it's not the cost, it's this. This being the concept of nozzle alignment. What this part I've printed unassumingly does is shows you all the four colours and whether they align with each other, both in X and Y, and also on the sides, the Z alignment. It is insanely hard to calibrate for tool heads to be in the same place to sub millimetre or closer accuracy in three dimensions. It used to be a laborious manual process of using grub screws and adjusters, but thankfully we don't have to on the U1, just like we didn't have to on the Prusa Excel, generally. Under the bed we have this thing. What it does is it acts as a known shape for the nozzles to tap around at when calibrating. This is exactly what the Prusa Excel does with its little nut to get the exact location in XYZ space. It does this once, and then from that point on, as long as we don't change nozzles, they will all be calibrated relative to each other. When I did the Prusa Excel video about a year ago, I showed how the carriage to tool head docking mechanism works, and it's entirely passive. The snapmaker is the same, but the components have been moved around a bit. The tool head clamping mechanism is still entirely based on movement of the carriage, and this means that you save on motors, but also you're using a mechanism that has already been tuned to be accurate. The carriage, after all, knows exactly where it is at all times, because it knows where it isn't. I'm also quite happy to see at this stage the U1 is employing a CNC aluminium milled dock, which is nice and sturdy. I have confirmed with Snapmaker that the final version will also be made of aluminium of some sort. I don't know the process they're going to use to make it, but I know that it's not going to be plastic. Now each tool head looks hard to get into, they look impenetrable, but there's actually a secret there. It's just a magnetic cover that snaps off to expose the internals. Everything in here is relatively compact and simple, which is definitely a good thing, as there's four of these to maintain, so you don't want anything particularly complicated. It is a pretty standard gearing setup, as far as I can tell. I haven't been inside this bit. I think the gear ratio is around 4.5 to 1 with the configuration. Um, the small round motor running at 0.8 amps, which is, this is all pretty standard middle of the road in terms of extruder power. Don't expect it to be any problems. I can also confirm that it has no issues pulling 95A TPU all the way from the reel through the 
PTFE tubing. Although, while we talk about that, the tubes from the extruder to the back of the machine are wider than normal, significantly so. This is undoubtedly to reduce friction, and it's the first time I've seen that outside of a common mod that's done on the XL, which is um, something I actually need to get to, because it, it does help, it reduces friction. These two-way side feeders are kind of special and weird, and through the magic of having two, I can show you why. It turns out they're way, way more complicated than they look from the outside. The motor spins in either direction, but the direction of spin of the motor actually switches the lane of the feeder. Once that switching part hits the limit of travel, uh, you effectively have the a uh, fast equivalent of an extruder and it's worth noting that the motor looks to be closed loop as well so it can tell what speed it's spinning at and when it's stalled. I don't actually know how in the current implementation they're using that data or whether that's going to change but that gives it a lot of potential intelligence about how it's working. The really clever consequence of this mechanism as well is that it means you have a built-in auto-tensioning system for the filament meaning it isn't particularly susceptible to different materials or diameters or, or grip. As I said before, full disclosure, I have this spare one because mine started malfunctioning, as is the danger when you do something new and complicated. Luckily, if push comes to shove, this part is not integral to functionality as you can load manually, but yeah, there's, there's lots of surprises in this unassuming part on the side of the printer. While we're talking about repairability though, and how locked down this, this system is, in case you didn't know already, this is a clipper-based system, though we might as well have a look inside Getting to the main board was not too tricky. You can see it's fairly predictable in there as well. What we have is a fairly standard clipper setup with ARM chips, EMMC, DDR4. This is normal clipper stuff. And I also have some good news about this. Snapmaker have multiple times confirmed internally to us that they plan to release the clipper code. And as things stand on the pre-release units, we do have access to the config files. So I think a lot of people will be happy to hear that. On the same topic, I think a lot of you will also be happy to know that as well as Snapmaker's Orca fork being the standard slicer for this machine, they're no longer using their own slicer, the U1 is also already rolled into the main Orca slicer itself, and it has been for a few weeks now. Okay, so another advantage of a tool changer aside from the ability to swap tools instantly if you have the preheat set up correctly, is that it can be true multi-material. TPU is a breeze for a tool changer, poses no challenge whatsoever, and I've even printed this ball with an offset PLA hardcore and a PIBA outer. PIBA, I presume that's how you pronounce it, nobody's really talking about PIBA because it's relatively new in the 3D printing scene, the video is coming out soon, but this thing bounces and it bounces erratically. It's hilarious. You're probably wondering what I'm doing. It's called soldering. Maybe you've heard of it. I'm just soldering one of my PCBs I ordered from PCBWay. I know it looks way more professional than anything I could possibly make myself, but believe it or not, I designed this PCB. And so can you. It's easier than you think. After all, I managed. PCBWay can provide you with all kinds of boards and colours and number of layers that you want. This board I'm making here is pretty basic by their standards. You can get a lot more complicated than this. You can do multiple layers. You can do, uh, at some point I will, flexi PCBs, RGB PCBs, whatever you want, nearly, you could do it. PCBWay also provide other services like CNC parts without the hassle of having to figure out how to make them. You can literally just upload a step file and a technical drawing and tell them to make it and it comes out somehow, which is a mystery to me, but I guess it's experience. Also PCBWay offer resin, FDM, various other 3D printing technologies. All of this is incredibly easy to access through their website, which has plenty of guidance on what each thing means and how to use it. Check out the links in the description below and make sure to get the new user coupon if you are a new user. Thank you PCBWay for sponsoring this episode. So the on paper side of the U1 is all good and well, how does it perform in reality? Well, as part of the beta program there have been around 46 test units out there with a mix of people including reviewers and we've all been trying to break the printer for the last month-ish. What this means is that I can draw not only on my personal experience with the printer, but the combined experience of the secret beta group. 
And my personal take on the goings-on in that group is that the bulk of the questions and issues logged are about software and firmware and not so much about hardware. I think the vague consensus I'm seeing is that the design of the core parts of the printer, meaning the tool changing and the printing itself, the extruder, the nozzle, so on and so forth, they're all actually already basically there. And that's why what you're going to start to see in the coming days are some really impressive flawless prints coming from absolutely nowhere being shown off. Whereas on the flip side, what you're not going to see, for example, are the various networking issues that are currently a problem for some of us, but not others. While for me, the machine is most definitely at a point right now where, especially for the price, it's good enough to use essentially forever in its current state. I'm just very aware that the machines the U1 will be competing with in the actual market have incredibly slick menus and user interfaces. The U1 will need to be that polished, ideally on release, if it isn't going to face intense criticism. The pricing of the Kickstarter is a little complicated, but there's a significant discount in the early bird, and I'll put an affiliate link in the description, which if you do decide to jump in on the Kickstarter, then using that will be appreciated. And this is no doubt immediately followed by people asking me if they should back the Kickstarter, and I'm not the right person to answer that for you. Again, I could tell you what I think, I could tell you my experiences, but this machine is going to be popular, and I mean it's going to be really popular. In an ideal world, everyone who wants the printer should be able to take their time and buy it when they're ready. I think in my opinion and from my gut instinct, I think that even Snapmaker are probably going to have underestimated the amount of interest this printer is going to get. And you can check whether I'm right or not, because if all goes well, this video will be released exactly when the Kickstarter starts. That got a bit ranty though towards the end, but I think in summary, I'm particularly excited about the Snapmaker U1. But I'm particularly excited about what the Snapmaker U1 represents. I want it to succeed because I want everyone to have access to an affordable off-the-shelf tool changer that works out of the box and works well and doesn't waste filament. And I think this part is a message to Snapmaker as much as it is to anyone else. The beta testers can see the potential of this machine to deliver that experience. And what's at stake here isn't just the U1's reputation, but the reputation of the affordable tool changer itself, the entire concept of it. It is literally that important, I think. So yes, as a final thought, Snapmaker, don't mess this up. Make it what it deserves to be and what it can potentially be, which is the biggest printer of 2025. Thank you for watching.